Hello and welcome. I'm your host, author Ryan M. Oliver, and this is the Mighty Books Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Mighty Books Podcast. Today with me, I have David Moyel. Uh, David, since 2014, has written five books focusing on aspects of U.S. film history, all of which have been published by McFarland and Company of Jefferson, North Carolina. A native Californian, David recently moved to Gig Harbor, Washington, where he loves to look at the cedar trees outside his window as he writes. David, how are you this morning? Or actually this afternoon. Yeah, it's it's afternoon. The day is, is going quickly. I'm I'm fine. And how are you today, Ryan? I'm good. A little busy as we were talking about before. It's been a hectic day, <laughs> but we're here and we're gonna talk about some cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. And thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm glad we can make this happen. I'm really glad. Uh, so I want to talk about we're we're focusing on one primarily today, but you have a whole, I guess, a whole gang of books, five of them. Uh, what book are we primarily talking about today? Well, this is the most recently released. It just came out about a month ago. Um, it's uh, titled Joan Crawford in Film Noir, the actress as auteur. And so anyway, that's kind of what it is. It's a very distinctive approach to studying, well, to, to looking at Joan Crawford. And I, I think there are a lot of books about Joan Crawford, but I think this one has a really, really interesting slant to it that people interested in the subject or only peripherally interested in the subject would really enjoy. So I'm curious because I'm only, I've only just recently heard the term film noir. What is film noir for those who are not familiar with the term? Oh, sure. No, film noir was, it, it, it's really interesting because people are still arguing about, is this a movement? Is this a style? Is this a genre? It actually kind of emerged in the early 1940s. And um, it, it, noir, um, well, it's, it's, it's basically French for the black film. Yeah. And what happened was there were a lot of influences that like converged around the same time around 1940 that created a certain type of film that, uh, you know, a great example would be Double Indemnity. That's probably the best known movie with Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. Uh, it is film noir. Um, very dark in tone. And that's reflected by the way the films are shot by the cinematography. It's a lot of dark shadows, you know, people walking out of the shadows into the light, you know, when we have moments of revelation and then people receding back into the shadows when we find out they're really evil or, or something like that. There are a lot of elements to film noir. I, I go through that in, in the introduction um, a, a, a lot in the book, but it's really become an incredibly influential form. You know, since then, there was a, there's a classic film noir period they went from 1941 to 1958. And then since then, it's evolved into things we call neo-noir. And it started out as in like the crime film or, or um, you know, where there's a murder and people are trying to cover up a murder and, and something like that. And then, you know, obviously people, you know, find out that crime doesn't pay and you can pay a big price themselves. But, but it's since evolved into its influence is pervasive you can see the influence of film noir in many 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 uh the stuff that you see on television or still at the theater if you still go to the theater these days i you know i was just looking at there's a um on netflix there's a, a new mini series called ripley that's about uh, the talented mr ripley and it's a great example of neo-noir. It's shot in this very noir style, black and white. It was dominant black and white. And, you know, it's, um, you know, very dark story. <laughs> and and um, so anyway, that, 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 that's basically it. I mean, there are books that are written about the subject and people endlessly argue about what is noir and what is not noir. So anyway. The different layers of noir, like this is very dark noir. This is, you know, honeyed noir or milk noir. I don't know. I don't know. There are people like I had written a book in the past called The Noir Western, which was a book about how 
film noir really had an impact on the post-war Western in the U.S. And there are a lot of, you know, we think of the Western as a very positive genre in, in a lot of ways, traditional Westerns, but that, um, you know, with noir, the, the Westerns became darker, uh, they were more pessimistic in tone, um, things like that. And you see that most Westerns that have been made recently, like say within the last 30 or 40 years, have been very dark, have been very influenced by, by noir. Yeah, very harsh, very harsh. And like um, they're trying to go, I think, for more like violent realism or more because it was very the Westerns in general, being a person from the West or moving out West and living in that area that time. It was not an easy, it was a rough and tumble, hard to come by, hard to live in area. At least that's what they portray it as. I assume it's not, it wasn't exactly, you know, rainbows and, and sunshine all the time. But yeah, you know, and it is, as I said, like generally in noir, it's kind of like a dark take on human behavior. Yeah. Um, so that's that. It was really influenced by World War II. I mean, it was a huge influence on it. And then um, a lot of the, um, the, the crime novels of Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler and uh, people like that ha had a huge influence on, you know, film noir as well. And then it also has some roots in, silent German cinema and stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> Go there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got to come from somewhere. It's got to come from no, somewhere. Yeah, it, it came and just all of a sudden brewed and came together about this time. Yeah. And as I said, I think it was very heavily influenced by World War II. So... Again, Phil, World War II was not a was was not a light topic, that's for sure. So, so when you're talking film noir, it's not just... It's literally the lighting and the cinematography is darker but the story itself is also darker yes no the cinematography is reflecting you know it's it, it's the sort of thing i think great cinematography is always reinforcing meaning in one way or another yeah and uh you know it's not just pretty pictures and uh um and and so the the, the films at the time were often people trying to do things and getting it over their heads and paying you know the price you know dealing with the consequences of that. And, uh, you know, a lot of schemers in film noir who were trying to like make their fortune and stuff like that. And, you know, but it is, as I said, it was very, very heavily influential. There are a lot of aspects to it. There many books have been written about it. So um, anyway, there's lots out there for people who are more interested nice. in, in pursuing this. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, do you have, what, what some are some examples um, of like current day? I know you just mentioned one from Netflix. Are there other like bigger movies or TV shows that have come out that God, are awful. film noir? Well, I'd have to think about it. The um, Scorsese film, um, oh. the, uh, yeah, Scorsese's uh, been very, very influenced by film noir. And, uh, uh, yeah. Um, and, and, and well, even something like, like Raging Bull, was shot in like very much like the, the black and white and really, really use black and white well to, as they said, reinforce meaning in the story. Right. Um, but, you know, things like the, you know, there's a lot of these very dark movies that have been made in color. You know, it isn't, they just have to be black and white. It yeah. doesn't, you know, but um, like The Departed, I think is a very, very noirish story, oh. very, very dark story. That's where so, I, that's where immediately where I went to when you said Scorsese. I'm like the Departed. <laughs> I think that that's where I went to. Right there. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. It's so crazy, uh, and it's so, and it is a dark story. It's not for the, uh, it's not for the the innocent. I'll say that right now. You <laughs> you're knowing you're gonna you're gonna see and hear some things that are definitely on the darker side of life. They're emulating that, and Scorsese is known to make very raw movies. Yeah, it's interesting though too. I would love to dive in a little more with. Film noir on my own personal time. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's, it's Scorsese is like Taxi Driver. Um, oh yeah, you know, Goodfellas. I mean, all these movies are very noirish. <laughs> that's that's the two I just thought of. Well, it's Goodfellas. Thought of Goodfellas. I forgot about Taxi Driver. I haven't seen. I saw that actually fairly recently. I would say last last two years. I watched that, and it is definitely it's a very interesting portrayal. Now, for for film noir, are the, noir are they usually it's focused on like one particular person or it can be an environment. It doesn't really matter. It's just more or less the, the feeling of, of uh, darkness 
and uh, their, you know, the external darkness and also their internal or the violence, violence well, or darkness. Um, it, but it, it's usually there's one person who is, you know, it it can go, it's usually crime is in, a crime of some kind is involved, often a murder. Um, there's usually a person who is, you know, involved in one way or another, you right. know, like it, it could be like, um, you know, I think a classic example that a lot of people are familiar with is double indemnity. Um, that is basically about a woman seduces this man and together they plan to kill her husband to get her husband's money. And so that's a classic story. You see it, it's the postman who always rings twice. You see it in the modern era of movies like Body Heat. And so that's like a classic noir plot. Of course, um, you know, people pay the consequences often. <laughs> so there are exceptions, but anyway. Very cause and effect. And usually the effect is not is not good. <laughs> it's not a yeah. fun outcome. And um, yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. But but you know, it's interesting that noir has spread in like it started out in the crime genre, but it's also, I mentioned the Western earlier, but there are noir westerns and then there are things, um, there are noir science fiction films like Blade Runner um, is something like totally very noir, very dark, you know, very dystopian type of future sort of thing and very heavily influenced by noir. So anyway. So what, what drew you to that type of filmmaking? What did that start? Well, I, well, I tend to see the world in a dark way, I guess, in, in, in some way. You know, um, it, it's just, especially as I get older, I, I it, you know, things seem to get darker and darker. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's another whole, whole conversation. Anyway, no, I it's just, you know, I love old movies, you know, and I mean, my parents uh, were from that era and I, I'm old enough to remember being taken to the uh, drive-in movies, you know, and uh, brother and I would watch the cartoons and my mother and father would expect us to go to sleep and then they would watch the adult movie, you know, the more grown-up movie. And I I would always stay up. I would always be really interested in finding out what was going on on, on the screen there. And um, so I've, I've always just been a huge fan of movies. And I think as I've uh, gotten older, you know, I just uh, looked more and more into the classic era in Hollywood, like from probably the 30s, 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s yeah. is the period that most people consider the classic era. And I find the movies to be wonderfully sophisticated. I mean, they aren't, um, you know, like you, you don't have the special effects in, in the way that you do today, but um, the movies are often just beautifully written. The acting, I think, is really good. I think a lot of it just really, really holds up. And um, so I tend to gravitate more toward those films. And I tend not to have a lot of patience. You know, I don't really like the, you know, contemporary films where everyone has to make a three and a half hour film, you know, in order to be considered significant. And, uh, you know, I really like films that like really move along, have a really fast pace, say what they're going to say. And like, let's just keep going folks. Mm -hmm. And that that's another aspect to the, these. I, I mean, there, there's all sorts of the, the, the wow. music. They brought these great composers over to Hollywood during the time to write just these great film scores for films. And, um, so anyway, I'm I'm just a big fan of that that period, the classic film era, and noir was something that I kind of came to kind of later later in life that I I just kind of um, said, wow, you know, this is really interesting. Let mm -hmm. let learn more, and and then it reminded me of a lot of movies I've been seeing throughout my life that were yeah. neo noir. I found out about later, you know. So anyway, that's that's kind of part part of the attraction to the whole thing. It's interesting as we get older, the more realistic we want our media, our film, our even books or, or um, art to be, at least from my experience, I've wanted more realism and more quality of story. Now, I don't necessarily, you know, it's nice looking at cool things because a lot of CGI happens mm -hmm. nowadays, but I have had the problem since I was younger with all the CGI and everything. It's like, that doesn't make 
a story good. It can make it cool looking, but does it make it good? No, <laughs> not necessarily. So I've always been a fan. I've started to dive into more of like the 60s and 70s films. I haven't quite gotten to 20s, 30s, 40s yet, but um, I've noticed just with the acting, the cinematography, the it's everything seems just more raw and more realistic than some of the stuff that we watch nowadays. The 70s, especially. That was a period because after the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, then they kind of went into kind of a slump in the 60s. And then toward the late 60s, it started to really come back, like with Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate and Midnight Cowboy and things like that, where they really got back to kind of raw, honest roots. And there was this real renaissance in the 70s where you know, we we saw Scorsese, Clint Eastwood, you know, a, a lot of like people that we talk about all the time, you know, emerge. So, mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. I've, I've I've seen current movies lately or shows and I'm just like this. This doesn't it doesn't grab me when movies from the 70s like they made quite a while ago and I'm watching it. It just it, you, it doesn't let go. And the, what the beautiful part is I've found is you were talking about dialogue beautifully written and just those good conversations that are engaging those conversations and i found that that is that'll what that's what will hook me is a someone with a presence to show up on the screen give their piece if you don't grab me at that point in time i'm already half lost i'm already half gone because you have to have that presence and back then especially in the era we're talking about back then that was what that was the movie was people coming on doing their part and leaving if that performance was not spot on or powerful you lose the audience you have nothing you have nothing <laughs> well, you know it, it all comes back to i mean that's something i talk about in my books a lot too is it just it all comes back to a good script with good yeah. characters credible motivation um you know a story about something that people care about and it really does come back to that i i, I mean i'm um you know, I'm not a fan of the movies with all the special effects. And well, we're the characters here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They're yeah. just people dressed up as superheroes. And I'm sorry, I'm, I, I don't see any real characters or anything. So it's sad because we can do all these crazy things. Like I love reading stories and going through it in my mind. It's it just so impressive. But then when I see it on the big screen, it's like, I don't know why. I don't know what it is. It's about it's like that. It needs to look more real. But we were doing better things with cinematography when I, I feel like in the 70s and 80s where, yeah, it looks a little cheesy, but I don't know. It just it hooked me a lot better. It hooked me a lot better. So I want to quickly talk about why Joan Crawford? Well, yeah, no, that, that's another interesting thing. I kind of came to Joan Crawford kind of, you know, like I've known about her ever since I was a teenager. But, I you know, she really didn't um, really pique my interest until... Um, it was the same year I, st I started to, I was taking film classes at uh, Stanford through the adult continuing uh, education. Oh, okay. And the teacher was like a film noir guy. And so I had actually seen, you know, you know, and all of a sudden, oh, wow. Okay. Oh, double indemnity. Oh, that's film noir. Postman always been twice. Oh, that's film noir. And oh, okay. That, it all kind of makes sense to me now. And um, so that was about 2010. I started to take courses from this guy. And uh, anyway, toward the end of the year, uh, they have a revival theater down in, in Palo Alto, and they were showing film noir. And I went and saw the film Sudden Fear. And I, I talk about that a little bit in the prologue. And, you know, most of what I had heard about Joan Crawford, you know, I had seen her in a few movies, but I wasn't, you know, I, okay, she's not at the top of the list. And uh, and then you always hear about all the, the Mommy Dearest stories, the, you know, the stories uh, about the tell-all memoir that was written wow. about her that's very uncomplimentary. Mm. And um, anyway, so I, I went to see this film, The Sudden Fear, that I'd never even heard of. And it was great. I mean, it was just absolutely great. I mean, I just totally... Um, it's a, it's a woman in jeopardy movie, and um, I don't want to give away too much of it for people who haven't seen it. But it's um, you know, and she just gives an incredible performance. I was fascinated by scenes in the movie where she doesn't even talk, like you just see her, 
reacting to other stuff that's going on. And it's just absolutely fascinating. I mean, the door opens, the light comes in, you know, and you just see this incredible face with these incredible eyes and cheekbones and everything like that, just communicating all this stuff visually. And I, I was like, wow. And so I started to read about her. And I wound up reading six or seven biographies since then. Plus, she wrote two memoirs of her own. And there's a whole bunch of things. And, you know, there's tons of stuff online. Um, I mean, she has these huge fan groups on Facebook. I'm amazed at like, you know, 15, 20,000 fans, you know, like in these Joan Crawford fan groups. And then I just basically started watching more and more of her films. And, you know, I really feel that her career, she had this 47 year career uh, that went from like 1925 to 1972. And the first third of it, she's at MGM and she is kind of like playing the ingenue roles. You know, that Louis Mayer said, you know, Joan, you're MGM Cinderella. You know, you're, you're the working girl who makes it good, who finds her prince charming and everything like that. Those were her lighter earlier films. Uh, most of them were, though it's, some of them were actually pretty, I, I thought quite, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And her mid period is toward the end of her time at MGM and especially her time at Warner Brothers. And then afterwards from say 1941 to the late fifties is her mainly noir period. Oh. And this is when she really matures and really graduates into much more complicated, uh, I, I think much more interesting roles. And then kind of after the late fifties, I think her career declines, you know, for a number of reasons, but that happens to us all at one point or another. So anyway, but um, no, she had a long career. And one of the things that's, you know, I, I guess the other thing is I was just fascinated by the person. Yeah. She was a total perfectionist who, didn't apologize for it all. She like, you know, she, she, you know, was proud of the fact that she was a perfectionist, that she would work and work and work and work and work and finally get something to the point where she liked it. And, um, you know, and so, I mean, part of working with her was that you had to be a perfectionist too, or you had to, you know, like achieve like really excellent results too. But, you know, I really admire people who, really work hard because they they really want to produce a high quality product whatever that is yeah and um and so there there were just a lot of things about her personality i mean she had a lot of quirks very complicated person you know i'm not an expert like some of the biographers are of, about her personal life but anyway um you know i just admired that quality about her and i guess the more i, I was looking at it, especially during you know, like after about 1941, when she was really, really, you know, moving more into the noir period, how, you know, she really wanted to have more and more control over her films because, um, you know, she realized, you know, really early on, this is the collaborative art. You know, I need all these other people, you know, they, they all need to be there in there making me look good. And so, you know, I want to, control this as much as possible. And, and she gradually, as she went along, really earned that, that right. I mean, there are several directors that said, you know, I've worked with all these people and I've never met an actor or actress who knows more about every element of filmmaking than Joan Crawford. Yeah. And, you know, they said how she could talk about the camera angles and the lighting and, costume design and you know all those different things and her noir period is she actually managed to negotiate deals where she had um, more and more say in production decisions she could hire and fire cinematographers she really was involved in the casting of films and you get to a point like in this movie sudden fear it was after she left warner brothers she really needed to reinvent herself and so she she basically was the producer of the film. Wow. You know, they had, they had a guy who had the money, but and she did this in several other films too, where she basically acted as the you know producer of the creative part of the the enterprise there. Wow. Was she met with resistance? Because I know back then 
women weren't exactly in these le like roles where they were in charge. Was she met with resistance for being a producer or hiring and firing people? Were people well, not so happy with her about that? Well, there, there, there are mixed results. I mean, a lot of people were just really, really impressed with her professionalism and her knowledge. You know, the, the other thing she would do is she would be involved in script sessions and stuff like that and come up with a lot of ideas, you know, for changing the scripts. In fact, this film, Sudden Fear, these scenes where she's not saying anything you know, was like um, influenced by her career in silent film. She came in right at the very last really? year of silent films. And she had this, as I said, this great face. And she really knew how to like express, just register all these emotions. And she could just get, get up there and just, you could see it in her eyes. You could see exactly how she was feeling in her eyes. And um you know, and and so she really said, well, let's like work on this. Let, let's try to bring these silent film features to this this film, wow. you know, because it is a visual medium. It's not a verbal medium. You know, primarily right. it is a visual medium. The other thing is she also worked with a producer at Warner Brothers named Jerry Wald, who really understood her and really understood there was a Joan Crawford rags to riches story. You know, Joan Crawford was raised in like, poverty in Texas and Oklahoma and, and and she really wanted to escape that and you know once she got to Hollywood she said well no, I've escaped it now I just I don't want to be sent back I, I really want to make it here and so that was part of her incentive for you know I need to know learn everything I can about movie making you know I just want to have more and more control over what I'm doing and that just you know kept growing but, you know, for films, like, she would choose properties. You know, she she would, instead of waiting for a script to come to her, she she would go to the library and take books out and read. And, um, um, you know, she would see a film. And, you know, there's one film she made was a Swedish film that she said, oh, you know, there needs to be an American version of this. It would be really great. And so she went to Louis Mayer at MGM and said, oh, you've got to make this film. And you've got to put me in the lead, you know. And um, but she she had enough clout. I mean, her films generally made money, so she really did have enough clout to do a lot of the stuff. And as she kept moving on, she got more and more confidence, and and she continued to you know like to do that. And I I think it kind of faded out more toward the late fifties and into the sixties. Her you know, as I said, her career went down, but like during the 40s and 50s, the period that I really focus on in the book, I think she's at her height, both artistically and professionally, you know, from a, a career point of view. I feel like if she was, because um, when did she pass away? Oh, 77, 1977. Okay. I so feel like if she was alive during this era, she would be, have moved on to being a director. Oh no, she she'd be a producer director. She'd be like a Spielberg or someone yeah. like. She wouldn't be making the same type of stuff that he's doing. But I I think that you know. And the thing is that the other thing that she did with noir is a very male centered sort of thing. The vast majority of film noirs are about male heroes, and women are often treated very negatively. Like there's a care you know stock character in a film noir called the femme fatale there's the beautiful woman that seduces the poor guy and you know destroys his life and and things like that and what Crawford did was because it was Joan Crawford like she took noir in different directions you know she really some people say well it's not really true noir because you don't have a male you know hero and all this stuff and what Crawford did was she took noir in a lot of different directions. And a lot of them were dealing with women's themes. And uh, I think they made, you know, they it, it enriched noir. I, I mean, it really made, gave noir greater depth and dimension. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, other people were doing it too, but I don't think anybody put together as cohesive a body of noir work uh, no, there's certainly no woman who who did that as as well as um, Crawford did. If anyone wanted to get into watching Joan Crawford's work, what would you say to start watching first? 
Wow. I mean, you know, a lot of people do, and there's about six films that I would recommend. But, but you, you know what I, I would say, Mildred Pierce is um, the movie. She won the Academy Award for that. And, um, you know, another aspect of her career is her comebacks. I mean, she she had more comebacks than than anybody that you've ever heard of. I mean, she, you know, her career was you know, like in a really low ebb. And then she just did something. She just like went outside the box and came back with something. Mildred Pierce was probably the greatest of her comebacks. She was being aged out at MGM. She was like pushing 40 and MGM was grooming all these young stars like Lana Turner and Ava Gardner and Judy Garland and all that. And so she needed to go somewhere else. So she went over to Warner Brothers and, um, uh, she took less money, but got more of a say over the productions. And she waited two years, like they kept giving her scripts. And she said, oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. I don't like that. And Jack Warner was getting really very impatient. And then they found this script for Mildred Pierce, which is a really interesting novel by James M. Cain. He's the, he's the guy who wrote Dublin Denity and Post When Always Rings Twice as well. And they they made a wonderful film out of it. I mean, it got nominated for six or seven Academy Awards. She won. It was nominated for Best Film, Best Writing, and and a lot of things like that. And, th and that's, you know, I, I, I think that would be a really good film to start with. Another one is Sudden Fear, which I've talked about a couple of times already. Um, she got an Academy Award nomination for that as well. There's another one that I love that is a melodrama with very, very noir tinged elements to it called humoresque, which is with her and John Garfield, which I, I think is just a wonderful film. And it's, it's about a concert violinist and this older but beautiful patron who's neurotic as anything, you know, and the two of them fall in love and it, it, it doesn't go really well, but it's just absolutely fascinating. Um, to watch and it's just wonderful acting and really really well defined characters and the selection of the music and the performance of the music if you like classical music is it's just an amazing film so the, the, those would be three I, I mean I, I could continue to go on and on but I'll, I'm, I'll spare you. I'll spare I'm sure you. you. I mean, you have written a book on it, so yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> you know a thing or two. Yeah, there's plenty more to talk about in the book, but right. if you were to start with three, those would be the three that I would. Uh, oh yeah, you'll open a door to open the Pandora's box at that point and just find more and more films. Go down a rabbit hole, if you will. Yeah, no, yeah, you, yeah, you definitely will. And in all the films, the cinematography is just great. Um, in Mildred Pierce and Humoresque, there's a guy named. Ernest Haller, who got, he, he did the cinematography for Gone with the Wind. And this is black and white, totally different, totally different medium. And, is, you know, it's just stunningly beautiful images cool. that also really reinforce meaning, <laughs> you know, in, 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 in the story. And, um, and then in Sudden Fear, there was a man named Charles Lang who became her go-to cinematographer in the 50s. Um, who He got an Academy Award nomination for his work there. And um, as I said, there's just brilliant pieces where you have, there's one scene when she's hiding in a closet and you just see the door open a crack and you just see her eyes just looking out. And you realize that she has like very little of the screen that she's working with, but they're mesmerizing. I mean, they're absolutely mesmerizing. So anyway. Yeah, I I do like when you use those kind of close-up shots and it's all quiet. It kind of it pulls it pulls the audience into going, well, what's happened? That kind of mystery before they reveal of what exactly is going on in the scene. It's well, it, you know, it film is an intimate art. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that's the thing that I think that <clears throat> you could see that in silent film. And then when they went to talkies. They brought everybody from the theater. They brought all the writers, the directors, and the actors all from the theater, which is a very public. It's not as intimate in the same way that a movie can be intimate, where you can just bring the close-up in and, you know, see the one tear that's dropping from the eye or something like that. And she really knew how to work with the camera. I mean, she just really knew how to use the camera. And People who, can, who know how to be expressive on cue 
floor me because when it comes to like acting and, and being in that role and just turning it on, like, and that I cannot do that. Like, I think I'm just, I, it's silly to me when I do it, but watching people who are just so wonderful at their craft perform, it's, it's mesmerizing. So when you get someone who's to, to that good, it's just yeah, fun no, to watch. There was, um, is one film that I, I think is another, it's one of the last films that I talk about. It's called Autumn Leaves. She made it in 1956. And Cliff Robertson is her co-star in the movie. And at one point, um, he has he has a story that he's told on documentaries. The, the director said, Joan, I, I just want you to just, just shed one tear. I, I just want you to shed one tear. And Crawford looked at him and said, okay, well, which eye? Do you want the tear to come from? What? <laughs> you know, like this woman, like could do this stuff, you know. And um, you know, and I remember this Cliff Robertson, who's a very good actor himself, was, wow, <laughs> that's impressive. I, I mean, I could probably try, but geez, I don't know. Wow, how do you do that without like jabbing something into your leg? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. I, you know, I, I don't know, or, or being told that your dog died. I, I think they, they, they told the child actress one time, you know, they tried to get her to cry and nothing worked. And then the director came back and said, oh, we just got word your dog died. And she started to cry. Okay, let, let's roll. Let's, let's, let's get the camera rolling. <laughs> Find something visceral to make them actually react uh, realistically to, um, genuinely to that. Yeah. That's mean. <laughs> well, it's, it's manipulation. So anyway, yeah. definitely. Um, oh my gosh. So I am curious, um, how long does it take you? Because you've had several, five books done. And how long does it take you to compound all the research, um, validate the research? Because I'm sure you found some articles that were, articles and stories that were not necessarily true. You make sure they were um, legitimate. How, how long does it take you to generally get the information then to write a book? Like how long does that take? Well, I, I don't know. A lot of the stuff like the Crawford book, it took me probably about a year to do the actual writing, but you know, the stuff has been swirling around in my head for 10 years at least sure. before then. So some of the other books that I, uh, I've, I've done that, I haven't, I mean, one of the things that I'm writing about stuff that took place so long ago that uh, very few people are alive who can talk about. So, you know, I've, I've actually tried to interview some people and, um, you know, they're either 95 years old or, or they don't want to talk or both, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, but one of the things is my books are not long. They're all about 200 pages. And yeah. I don't like long meandering histories or biographies or anything like that. I like something to have a very specific premise. And that's something I really have tried to do in all five of the books that I've written, that I try to take a slant on a subject that really hasn't been taken before. Yeah. It's often it's familiar subjects like Joan Crawford or women in the movies of John Ford or something like that. And then just try to take a slant on the subject that, um, you know, people are like, oh, gee, I, I didn't realize that, you know, and so that's that, that's kind of what my goal is. So I, I'm probably pretty fast. I'm amazed at how much stuff you can find on, online. Oh, I, I, I'm just stunned by the number of articles, the number of stuff and yeah. i'm very free about you know uh honoring all the you know like quoting and and acknowledging all the the quotes and insights that i get from other people too i, I really do believe in, in 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 that yeah so it normally as i said it's about 200 more uh pages and uh depending on how much time i had like i i wrote three books fairly quickly and then i took a full-time job about seven or eight years ago and yeah. for six years i had to work <laughs> full time so it was really hard to come back and do this stuff you know while, while you're also doing that yeah it takes a long time to it takes a lot of focus and a lot of long hours to write a book by itself and you add work into there and it just it just makes it harder it just makes it yeah harder. and um yeah no it really is but but i was able to retire i guess about two and a half years ago so i'm 
back at it. I'm working on a sixth book right now. And, and so anyway, I'm uh, which is about the early 1930s film in the early 1930s, the early talkies period. And, um, and no one alive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and no one from that period is alive either. So. Sadly, no, sadly, no. There is a book that I read. It's, it's a, actually for kids, young adult, uh, but it goes into um, a little bit of the history of uh, Millier's, Oh, uh, George M Millier, yeah, the... yeah, Millier, and the invention of Hugo Cabret is the is the book. I don't know if you've ever read or heard of it. Um, Brian it was, Selznick. That was the source for Scorsese's movie Hugo. Yeah, I was not a fan of the movie, but oh. the book is very good. And it was interesting because um, I read it. and I'm like, is this actually true? Because they had a, a, a fictional character Hugo, and based around this whole you know, into with his life and, and also kind of orbiting uh, life of Millier's and mm -hmm. it was very well done. And then actually it has a couple of correct pieces of information. It kind of dove in onto his, his life and his um, work and holy cow, he really revolutionized kind of the start, got the ball rolling looked like with uh, a lot of film The went on your, in your silent film store uh, book. Did you talk a lot about him as well? Well, no, no, he's right at the beginning of silent film. He's like 1900, you know, yeah. from the earth to the moon. And, and uh, yeah, um, no, my book on silent film was really about the last year of 1928. Okay. I call it the, the long 1928 because it's a period right from when the jazz singer was introduced to it's about a year and four months that covers this very strange period where people have been producing silent films and all of a sudden you have the jazz singer that comes out and everyone says, oh, we have to switch to sound. But there's all these silent films that are coming through the pipeline. And part of it was a lot of people knew that big change was coming and there was this real emphasis on the part of a lot of these artists that you know, this might be the last time I can ever do a silent film. Like Douglas Fairbanks and uh, Chaplin felt that way. Harold Lloyd felt that way. Um, and they really put their all into the making of these films. And it's an amazing year for film. You know, everybody talks about 1939 being the greatest year of the movies. And, you know, we can argue for or against that, but... You know, before then, I, 1928 was an incredible year. There were, there were just an amazing number of really, really excellent films. So that's what that book is about. Oh, okay. So I just want to touch real fast on, I saw here in your bio that you've done a bunch of poetry books and you did a lot of, looks like hundreds of articles from newspapers, magazines. Was this a prior career you used to write for? Or was this something you did on the side? Frankly, all of the stuff that's listed in the bio that you have is stuff that I did on the side. I, I spent 40 years basically working as a business writer, uh, mostly for high tech companies. Um, I did uh, speech writing. I did a lot of executive speech writing. I've written hundreds of speeches for probably about 75 or 80 different executives. Um, uh, a lot of the people I wrote for many years, I wrote for Visa, the credit card people. I wrote for their CEO and um, the CEO of Visa USA and um, the executives of Visa Latin America and Visa Europe, people like that. And then I've also done employee communications writing and uh, also a lot of marketing writing, just a lot of marketing writing too. So that, 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 that's how I paid the bills, you know, for probably about 40 years. So anyway, so anyway, that that's the end, all the stuff there, like, you know, I, I always wanted to have part, you know, like, even though th this was kind of like your commercial work, you, you kind of do it and you, it, it's like the job and you get it, you know, paid, but I always wanted to have a part that was personal writing. Yeah. So um, when I was young, I tried to write plays then I got into my 30s and and gravitated into the poetry, and I did that for about 15 years or so. And then, uh, oh, I guess since about 2010, I, I I wrote short stories. I did some short story writing for a little while, and then um, and then I got into this film class. I got excited about film. 
I started writing articles that you could send out to various film websites and things like that. And um, then the first one was someone said, oh, well, gee, you've got several of these. Why don't you put them into a book? Right. And I know you wanted to talk about publishing first, just about how I, what happened was I, you know, I had no, you know, I said, oh, I'll, I'll just write articles about stuff. And then someone uh, who had a website said, gee, you know, you have a lot of articles here, you know, that this could be put into a book. And so I said, okay, well, this is like film history. This is kind of, you know, I I, I wouldn't call it highbrow scholarship. I'd call it maybe middle brow or something like that. <laughs> That, it, that it's, you know, it's not, I, I mean, I try to be very accessible, you know, like I'm, I'm a gateway writer, you know, like I'm not someone who's so esoteric that you're not going to understand who I am or what I'm talking about or anything like that. I prefer that. You know, I, mean, you know, I mean, this is communication. We should be able to get our point across to other people. That's my thought too. <laughs> and so anyway, you know, that that's the style. It's, it's, it's accessible. The, the books are you know, fairly short, um, and, and all of that. So what I did was I started by, uh, you know, someone said, well, why don't you just start contacting university presses? And so I did. Then someone at one of the university presses that focuses on biographies of old, older directors said, you know, we really like the way you write, but this isn't quite for us. What about McFarland in publishing? And that, is the publisher that I, I've used. I contacted them and they got back to me and they liked it. And they said, oh, well, can you finish this book? You know, what do you need to finish this book? And um, that's really how it how it started. So they, they you know, write about, a lot of them is like pop art subjects, but they try to write about them in an intelligent way. You know, it's not just, you know, like writing gossip or stuff like that. You know, there is some, gossip in, in the books. I mean, you, you can't help but, you know, talk about that sometimes when you're talking about Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but um, so, I mean, they're, they're an interesting publisher. They have like a large sports writing. A lot of people write sports stories like baseball, like a lot of baseball books and, and um, things like that. I found them to be really good to work with. I mean, they're very supportive and, um, one of my previous books, the uh, the noir western, won an award. It was voted the best film noir book of you know uh, several years ago from um, uh, it's called Classic Images Magazine. And mm -hmm. so I've you know I've I've kind of like earned a few brownie points with the publisher for doing stuff like that. So anyway, yeah, they can say that was a good choice to bring you on. Um, well, yeah, yeah, and it's you know it's not. You know, I, I will say it, you know, it, it's not a field where you're you're going to make a fortune, you know, like writing about this stuff. But I do it for pleasure more than anything. You know, it's just interesting um, to, um, you know, delve into these subjects and you're, you're just in another world. You know, I know that some friends of mine were saying, well, where, where, where are you traveling, you know, this summer, David? Like, where, where, you know, like, where? and I said, oh, I, I, I time travel. I go back to the 1940s and watch black and white movies where the rain is falling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People yeah. die in the gutter and stuff like that. A anyway, so anyway, um, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing these days. That's great. So they're, they're good. It sounds like a good publisher to work with. And do they help you with your research at all by like, do they cross-reference things, make sure everything's good? Do you have a partner uh, um, who, who check, no, kind of I, mean, I, check? I actually have an editor who has really helped me with, um, right. uh, who had worked for, um, you know, an academic publishing house. Uh, she's okay. retired. And so she's really helped me with many of the books, but I've, I've had to go back and check, you know, I do a lot of that myself where you just want to be sure that, you know, you're saying the right thing or, or, and sometimes when you don't really know, like, you know, it's like, you'll see one version of the story here and you'll see another version there. And, you know, you just say, okay, well, you know, this is in dispute, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly <laughs> what this person said, this is what that person said. And, you know, this is kind of what I believe, but you know, like you, you decide what you want to believe. So, yeah, as long as you, I like that. If I like when books like yours do that, I go, here's the story that I have found. There's two sides. Here's the evidence to support both. I can't make the decision for you, but uh, here, you know, just you lay out the information out there and let the yeah. reader figure it out. You try not to be biased either way. 
to me, that's the best, that's more responsible uh, yeah. journalism or writing in this case. Uh, so I appreciate that you're doing that the books. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to. I mean, I, I don't have a huge political agenda. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. Because uh, then you'll lean one way or the other. And it's like, no, just I want the facts. Just want the facts. Let the reader figure it out for themselves. Was this good or bad or was this whatever? It, it It's better that way. In my opinion, I like to try to be as unbiased as I possibly can. Let the Let the reader figure it out with the information that you've given them. I had a quick question. What brought you here to Gig Harbor from California? Uh, well, it, there there were a whole bunch of reasons. My son and his family moved from California. I've got two grandsons and everything like that that are living in the Pacific Northwest right now. And, um, you know, cost of living. So there, there, there were, and then we do have some other friends up, up in the, the area too. That's so right. It just is, you know, it just has worked out really nicely. So. Yeah. Getting together with some family. And you know what? You've come to a good location. There are so many authors up here. Holy cow. I'm finding more and more that live up in Washington, Seattle, have come out from all around Washington State, Pacific Northwest, because, you know, it rains a lot. What do you do when it rains? You sit inside and write stuff. <laughs> The writing is a perfect occupation for the winters. You know? uh, it totally, that's what I do a lot during the winter time, fall and winter. It's nasty out. Well, I'm going to sit here and work. So it it just makes sense. <laughs> when it's nice out, I go outside, and then when it's crummy out, I stay inside. It's just not that not that hard, challenging to figure out. <laughs> oh, it it's, makes it very easy. But hey, uh, that's that's why we're here. Have Have you always uh, lived up here, or did you move? I have always been in Washington State. I did have a short stint, about two years, where I was in the central portion of Washington State, going to school at Central Washington University in Ellensburg. I was there for two years getting my uh, teaching degree, and then I moved back here, and then the longtime girlfriend and I got married, so we've been together for a long time, and I've uh, been here ever since. I've traveled a bunch, but mm -hmm. I've never, have never moved outside of Washington State. I love the state. I have some qualms with it, but I love the physical state that i live in it's beautiful and i would love a little more sunshine but uh, we're we're so well rooted here there we'll, we'll probably never never leave washington permanently no i'm i'm just amazed at how nice people are and it's genuine i mean it's not fake you know oh have a wonderful day sir you know uh you, you know it's uh the, the i mean people are genuinely happy they seem to be happy and they seem to be very nice so. yeah I've just that's just a very simple thing, but I just really appreciate it. Yeah, there was some some study about like the nicest drivers in in the country, and Seattle was up there. I'm like, what? <laughs> Seattle's a nice drivers, and I was like, maybe not Seattle, but uh, I don't. Kids of County's not bad. <laughs> They're all on Interstate Five, right? Right between Tacoma and Seattle area. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting, but yeah. I mean. When you think about it, the sun's out, everyone's getting just dosed with vitamin D. So they're just happy as can be at that point. So maybe that's what it is. They're just high on vitamin D. <laughs> I'm very, very pleased to see everybody sleeping inside for too long. But um, anyway, let's get let's get to I want to know where we can get your books. Where can everyone find your books? Where can they buy them? Oh, well, sure. Um, Amazon would be the number one source. And then the publisher in McFarland uh, Publishing, they will sell all my books there. I think barnesandnoble.com, um, they're on there as well. Uh, but but th that's it. And unfortunately, I'm, I mean, it, it, it is a niche. So it is a niche. So if you're interested in any of the um, subjects, I, I know that three of the five books that I've written so far are you know, they, they deal with women in film a lot, like the women in the John Ford films, um, Joan Crawford, and another book about women film editors, which I thought was a wonderful story about how women really played a dominant role in film editing in an era where women just didn't work behind the scenes, except as costume designers or makeup people. Anyway, yeah, it's, as I said, Amazon would be a great place to start. And if you like the book, please give it five stars and write a user review. <laughs> it's challenging people to write user reviews. But anyway. Yes, uh, it is. Yeah, it, it is. A lot of people don't like to write. But uh, anyway, so I, I guess that, that makes us distinctive and, you know, sets mm -hmm. us apart. <laughs> Yes, it does. Yeah. But like, what do you do for fun? Oh, I write. I, I torture myself with making sure words, the sentences and pages sound correct. 
what? <laughs> yeah, I do it for fun. Oh, oh okay. They're looking at me kind of weird. But if, if you like to do it, you like to do it. And uh, clearly you're not going to stop, which is good. I say keep keep making as many as you possibly can because we mm. have fun doing it. So why would we stop? Yeah. So, yeah, as I said, Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or a publisher would be three places to start. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this has been great, David. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about John Crawford and Film the Weir. I know a little more now, so this helps me out. I'm going to probably go watch some movies this weekend. That's for that's for darn certain. Got to go check out some good films. Oh, yeah, they'll be pretty dark. Just be sure you're in a good mood when you sit down to watch the movie, you know, but, but anyway... <laughs> You know, that's oh. kind of my that's kind of my area anyway, uh, for the current movies I watch. So I think I'll be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds great. But listen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Yeah. So. Thank you for coming in. When you do get more projects out or it's been a while, you just want to chit chat some more. I'm happy to host another uh, chat. I think it'd be fun to talk again in the future. OK, no, that sounds great. No, I'm. Love to do that. Excellent. All right, guys. I hope you really enjoyed this. Go get some wonderful film history books. Check out the movies he recommended and just, you know, dive into the culture of American film history. I think it'd be fun. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And as always, stay mighty and keep reading. <laughs>